Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again, again here in HIPA. Today we have a special lecture with the Canon, and we have today our lecturer, uh, Gary Schmidt. Uh, we will enjoy this lecture today, and as usual, I will tell you some orientation. There will be a 15 minutes break. Uh, it's about in about uh, 7 or 7.15 for 15 minutes, and uh, we will finish also about 9 o'clock. Please don't forget to take your certificate when you finish, and uh, the lecture here is live streamed. If you wish to share the link with someone who uh, couldn't make it to come today, please uh, find it on uh, our social media or on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much and enjoy the lecture. Hello everyone. Um, as you all know, my name is Gary Schmidt. What you might not know, I'm originally from Austria. I'm very pleased to be here in this Hiba Auditorium and to have this workshop about architecture and interior photography with you. Um, because this field as a hotel photographer, this is my specialized field. Um, I, want to, I want to give you a deep insight about my way of working um, among the leading hotel photographers. Uh, on the end, it is not rocket science, even if there are some technical parts and some tricks, but uh, the main thing will always be your approach and your eye for aesthetic and balanced compositions of a photo. I will start the presentation with uh, a small overview about my, my personal path from the very early beginning till the day I am today. And, um, <coughs> sorry. and after this in introduction, we will go through all this part, what is needed for, to make, create a good architectural photos from the technical part, from the composition and also to the post-production, which is, of course, nowadays very, very important. Um, I'm not aware of your photography level. Maybe there are some professional photographers, some very ambitious am amateur photographers, which might get in professional very soon, and some um, hobby photographers. But what we all share together is our love for photography. And on the end, we all try, including me, to to develop and to improve our way of telling stories with photos. And so let's let's get started. Can you mic turn the light a little bit down? Can you turn the light a little bit down? Thank you. So let's get started. This is a small overview about some of my clients, not all my clients. And as you see, it's quite vast amount already. So hotel, as luxury hotel and resort photographer, I'm conducting photo shoots all over in the Middle East, all over in Africa, in the Indian Ocean area, in the Asian, still in the former Russian and Russian area, partially in Europe. And just recently I got once an inquiry from a very new marketing executive in a hotel in Morocco, and she was asking me, um, may, can you tell me how many hotels you photographed already? And I was smiling a little bit and I had to politely answer, I, I don't know. And I'm not even able to count anymore how many hotels I was photographing, but I could tell her for her particular brand, it was around 30 hotels in the last few years. So this will be roughly the topic we're going through. Like at the beginning, we go about uh, the different styles of architecture because I quite, is it, is it area photography, is it some interior photography, also the cityscapes. And the technical part will be one, one major part of it because this is always the most important. Okay, many people are asking always about which camera setting and more importantly, which lenses you're using. And then we will go through the camera settings, the lenses, and for the composition part about selecting how to select the best camera angle. What what mistakes are commonly in architecture photography. The styling composition, yes, the lighting between continuous and strobes. So there's a two big difference in the look and feel of your image. Does it have more atmosphere with continuous light? Is it more like feeling like a daylight image where you use the strobes? 
location scouting, I will explain a little bit how the typical day for me looks because you can't just show up and take the photo. You, there's a little bit free work around, okay, what is the best time of the day? What is the location, especially for exterior, where you can position yourself? Or do you need a crane? Do you need access to an opposite building? Um, people in architectural shots is also something which is some uh, very common. And there are some things to consider how to make the an architectural shot plus people inside. What is for me a very beautiful part is artful details. It's not always like showing with a wide angle every everything. It's very much important or needed for most things, but things you look show closer are transporting a little bit more emotion. And this is still architectural photography for me. And also then in the post-production, like um, quickly about the, the, the workflow, how you work then in Photoshop, because like, as you know, for interior photography with views outside, the camera are not able to capture everything on one shot. So you need, sorry. Okay, they just told me it was a little bit too calm. Is it now a little bit better for you, also in the back? You can understand? Okay, I will try to speak up a little bit so that you can hear me a little bit better. So I think the last one was a thing, it's about the post-production, which is nowadays more and more important because I said, with one image, it's difficult to capture an interior, including the view outside. So you need multiple exposures, and you have to combine them in one image, and this, there's no way around Photoshop. Um, so, but let now let's go quickly about this small overview that you get an idea where I'm coming from, and to end it up here in this photography. Um, I don't know how many of you still remember or took photos in the analog days, but um, now you can guess my age then. Um, when I was 17, I started in a, in a photographic club and I had a DSLR, it was of course analog. And I had my own dark room in the attic where I spent many, many beautiful hours of developing uh, the paper sheets under the enlarger. And it's like beautiful. If you put this paper in the chemicals, and you develop the image and slowly, slowly it appears magical. It's, it's beautiful, only that you then can see, oh, one part was too dark or one part was too, too bright. And at this day in the, in the dark room, you had tools which remind you, if you use Photoshop, there's the tools dodge and burn. And this was under the enlarger where you partially give more light or hold light off. So this is still from the analog time, this way how the tools in Photoshop looks like. And, and this time still was for me when I was like going out on a photography walk. You just take your camera, you go, whatever is coming along. And at this time you, you still the film. So you have to decide before which film you give in, like is it a black and white film, is it a color film, which ISO you're choosing, 100, 200, 400, because it can't change. And which is for the most people most, most probably difficult to understand. You couldn't see after you take a photo immediately the result on the back of the camera because there was no LCD. You only could see your result after you got the film back from the labor developed. So this was like, um, it was like this, it was interesting. You were more careful about the things you're taking because you have 36 images. So you were thinking a few times, is it from here, is it from there? Nowadays people tuck, 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 tuck and choose afterwards. So this analog, it was, it was very good in a way. And then I started to work, these are some local newspapers in, in Austria. I was working for newspapers, writing, taking photos. And it was very interesting. The first time I started to get mon the first money out of photography. And the first time there was a, one of my photos printed and my name underneath, it was a really great feeling. And then it continues, then you work for a glossy magazine, you see first time your name in a glossy magazine, or the first time you see a photo on the cover with your name, or the first time later on you see one of your photos on a billboard. And these first times were always exciting, and nowadays I don't even know where all my photos are circulating and used, and, but it's, it's a nice way. And 
when I was working in a newspaper, then I got in this city there was a chance to work in a local photo studio. The lady, she was a very well-known portrait photographer in Austria. And at this time, it was uh, the Hasselblad 503 was an analog and the viewfinder, when you looked into it, the photo was square and upside down. So at the beginning, it takes a while to get used to that you see everything upside down. But again, it was a good training to see things because you cropped afterwards from a square image. This was the analog medium format film. And then only in the year 2000, it started the digital area. And still in the beginning, we, we photographed analog, but we had these high-end scanners to scan the negative and then doing post-production Photoshop because analog time, there was not much of retouching possible. You had your photos printed. You could do a little bit on the photo retouching, which was very minor. And at this time, Photoshop started. So I started quite early with Photoshop. Then uh, was the time I was teaching my my boss in the photo studio because she was not a generation from the computer. And it was a totally different world of possibilities open. And then I decided, okay, I love photography so much, I want to do it in a proper way. So I did this apprenticeship in Austria, which is usually three years to learn photography. I was already a little bit older, so I did it then in two years. And then you come to this photography school, there was still like, when you think about this, this is in the left up corner, this is the way all the layers have been in a film. There have been many, many layers. This was a way how you could capture color or black and white images. And <laughs> if you see here, this version of Photoshop 5.5, this was one of the first version I started using Photoshop. The recent version of Photoshop is 19 point something, so quite some years ago. And even then in this <coughs> photography school, all the teachers have been quite um, settled, el elderly photographers. And they, for them, computer was also new. So it was like, again, me, where I was like knowing almost more than them in the Photoshop part. And it was a very interesting part in, in photography school. When you develop also color images, your eye gets very trained about color. Because you, can, you think, oh, this image is perfectly. Then the teacher tells you, no, there's a magenta. Then you do it again, then you realize, oh yeah, now the whites are white. So and still now in, in Photoshop, like this is my retouching team, you, you differently use to see colors or wrong colors especially. And my first contact with large former cameras was also in this photography school. These, they look quite old now, but they still, as you can see, the digital back, they're still in use. Because these large former cameras, they have extremely a lot of options, which especially for architecture photography is very interesting. Because you have these tilt and shift options. There's still some lenses I will show you later for DSLR, which I think I'm talking too too calm here. Yeah. I think now it sounds a little bit better, isn't it? Wait a moment. Sounds better? Okay. Um, we were with these large format cameras because the possibility with this tilt and shift, which is even like in DSLR, it is available with tilt and shift lenses. I will show you then. In DSLR, it's still a little bit more limited with the, with the range of tilt and shift, but um, with the large format cameras, you could do incredible things. It's you can select the depth of field, the focus on a single point, not like in a layer. Or if you photograph, like as you know, we photograph pointing upwards, the lines, the verticals are not straight anymore. With a large format camera, if you kept this one vertical and only put it the lens upwards, still the image had vertical straight lines. And this is a benefit you can use also with the tilt and shift lenses available for DSLR. And uh, this principle of tilt and shift is for me chime, chime called chime fluke, so that everything is still straight. And the resolution compared with a DSLR, digital 35 millimeters, is like around 15 times higher with this large format. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and after I finished um, this photography school, I made then also like this uh, multi 
four, uh, four semester multimedia design academy, which was everything about graphic design, film, photography, where the photography part was to me quite easy because I had the photography school already. And after this, I had to do the, the master in craftsmanship for photography because in Austria, you, it was not allowed to make your own company without this master in a craftsmanship. And then in 2005, I opened my own studio in Austria, which was more specialized in portraits and commercial photography. There were some hotels on, on a smaller scale, a lot of this, this tourist areas, family-run hotels. And in this time, it started then getting jobs from Dubai. So me and my other photographer, we started to flew into Dubai for some jobs, forward, backward, forward, backward, but more frequently. And then it was like, hmm, Dubai could be a very interesting place of because of opportunities. And so then in 2009, I moved to Dubai. At the beginning, it was my one-man company. And uh, my field of photography was still very, very wide. I did fashion photography, jewelry, products, food, architecture. So it was kind of, kind of everything. And only later on, I, together with two fellow photographers, Stuart and Xavier, we founded this studio, White Soap Studios, which is our studio here in JLD, which is in the used mass, so rented out also to other photographers. And there's just a small overview I was very happy to have a very wide field of photography. So this was fashion photography I did. I did it at the beginning a lot for different magazines, for OK, for NBC Higher, for Ahlan, for all these magazines. Um, these are just a few samples from uh, product photography. Jewelry was always quite tricky because of all the reflections, but for sure some of you are quite aware of this one. The food photography, which I personally really love, and the first time I got approached for somebody uh, in Dubai, are you the guys doing also food photography? We never did it before, but I said, yes, of course we do. My partner was like, what, are, what the hell? I said, yeah. <laughs> On the end, for me, it doesn't matter what you take photos of. If it's food, products, or architecture, it's always about your eye, your approach, playing with light, seeing the texture, the angles, and we got to, we had to do this test shoot for three, four dishes, and the chef was really happy. It was a very good chef, and so and then we got the job. We had to read a little bit more deeper in food photography, and then we started doing professional food photography, and um, it, it went on, and uh, I'm still really loving it, especially now, especially seeing for hotels. The 80% is architecture, and the other 20% is food photography, because you have a lot of restaurants, or lifestyle photography, where you have models in the shoot. So it, it's always like a, a circle. Of course, some uh, cityscape photography, where you have to do by getting on the roof, permissions or no permissions to sneak in and out. Some uh, lifestyle photography for, for different brands, for different occasions. Um, travel photography always laughed a lot. I did together with Ivana, an Italian photographer, we organized a lot of travel photography workshops. So we, we were teaching photography in beautiful countries. It was like India, Vietnam, Cuba, and unfortunately Ivana got very busy, I got very busy, so we not have so much time to organize the trip. But in general, I love this travel photography workshop. Uh, here one more slide because I really love the travel photography. And this is like a, just like an overview from all the things what are happening. So to, to, to tell you how a typical day looks for me is I'm in a quite in a, in, a, in, a, in a lucky position that I don't have to look for work. I'm getting all my clients approaching me. Oh, we need you with a new hotel. Are you available? Can we go there? We have to make this shoot. And then it's for me about I'm getting a brief from them. OK, how many images they will need. So upon how many images we need, I can tell, okay, we need two days, we need five days, so that we can start planning the shoot, because most of my projects are outside of Dubai. That's very rare that I have projects in Dubai. So then we are back on this, what is the content now from the workshop itself. But before we go over this, uh, before we start with the technical part, we will go through a few images 
could you just get a few images of what my work is? So this is like um, typically it's, it's a serious shot where it's about oops, sorry, where it was about this client where you were you had to de define the position where to take the photo best because it's quite a tall building, so it's always like checking the surrounding. And there was one building where it was like uh, around six, seven floors high. You we could access the roof, and then you got quite nice an angle. Like what is, for example, on this image, it was like some of the lights were not working and they were not able, the engineering was not able to fix the lights. We told them the day before already, they still couldn't fix. You know it's very easy to fix these lights in Photoshop, but what you have to consider, if you have something reflecting below, you have also to, to switch the lights on in post-production, also in the reflection, because otherwise it would look quite funny if all the lights are on here, but still this few ones missing down there. You see it sometimes when you see lots of photos. Like for me, I can't look any magazine or anything in a normal way because you see mistakes in, 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 in retouching. Like, for example, this image was taken with a tilt and shift lens, where it's like um, you had to point up, but you can adjust it. So the vertical line staying normal. Tilt and shift lenses, they don't have an autofocus, but for me, I'm not bothered because like uh, my camera is always connected with the computer and via live view it's very easy to adjust the, the focus and buildings are not really fast moving so it's quite easy. Um, this is one of my main things I'm doing like for hotel photography, the interior photography and just for because this is quite a nice example, this is the, the perfect angle to show a room or the bed, because the bed from this angle looks always the best. If you shoot it from very this side on, it looks massive. If you prefer on this side, you don't see much what else is in the room. And we will talk about these difficulties between to get the outside and the inside on one image, because the dynamic range of DSLR cameras, they're increasing every generation of cameras, but still far away from what our eye is capable of seeing. This is, a, this is now the opposite of the perfect angle from a bed, but here the image was more about to show this area of the, of the hotel room. So it, this is a secondary shot. There's always like the primary shot, this is a secondar secondary shot where you show other important features in the room. Like if you have room or several rooms, it's always nice to show a little bit the connectivity that th this room is connected with with uh, another room, or you you can see. Sorry, partially, partially. Okay, there's the bedroom. As this is again a, a typically um, room, and what what you realize like if it's these rooms with two beds, it's very rarely that I show both bed in a full because otherwise it's getting very wide and the, the bed closer to the lens starts getting very distorted. So if you crop it, everyone knows immediately, ah, it's a twin bedroom. And among all my clients, I have so many differentiations in the, in the brand guidelines with how, what you can do, what you can't do. Like in some brands, I would not allow to keep these pillows on there. They say it has to be a white bed. In some brands, you're not allowed to keep these lights on during daylight shots. So it depends. As a good photographer, you have to be able to adjust to different brand guidelines. Like, a, for example, a Ritz-Carlton and a Waldorf Astoria or an Anandaro Hotel, the image has to look, they're looking very different. They have different philosophies. And globally, if you go to check any Ritz-Carlton in the world, they should have a similar look and feel of the image. So me as photographer for Ritz-Carlton in the Middle East, I should produce the same images as a photographer for Ritz-Carlton in Asia. And if I do in the next week a photo shoot for, for Marriott or for Anandara, I have to change my style according to their brand guideline. It's not always what I personally like best. It has to be the best for their brand philosophy. This was um, the same hotel as before. Again, it's like the, the opposite angle, but you have to see a little bit of connectivity. Rooms like this, 
they are quite a little bit tricky to photograph because you see there's a lot of things going on, a lot of furniture inside, very overloaded. It's a very, it's, it's beautiful, but a very intense style. So we had to move a lot of this furniture to move around. Like this chair was initially in there, so you have to move it around because if it's in there, it's overlapped by the, the, the sideboard. You can't see it, it doesn't look good. You have to remove a lot of things. Usually, usually there was a lot of things on here. There's like this old alarm clocks or old style. So we remove a lot of things. It's always like less is always more. This is always the easiest rule to remember is first remove everything and add very sparingly on the end. If it's too crowded or here's some overlapping, it's unavoidable because we had to show this furniture. But it's this kind of rooms quite tricky because there's a lot of furniture to move. Um, it's the same also like if you have like uh, big windows with outside, you you have to you have a lot of here we kept some light, uh, some little reflection that it looks natural, although you might can't see it on screen. There's some little reflections around here, but there will have been a lot of reflections. So there's always like you have to once make a photo with all the lights inside switched off, that you get a beautiful shot outside to combine it. But on the retouch samples on the end, we will see a little bit, okay, how to do this best and to keep it natural. Because if you remove all the reflections, it looks kind of fake. Um, a typical lobby area about people in the shot, we will talk again later. There's the same thing, like some people in the shot to give, especially with open kitchens, it's always nice to have some people. And as interesting on this shot, because we want, I wanted to have these chairs and this table balance, but the chairs have been actually quite low. So the chairs were low and there was a lot of gap in between there. So we put these chairs on empty coffee cups to, 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 to raise them up. You can't see them on the big genuine, but it looks perfectly for the composition and hiding the, 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 the not so nice area under the table. So it's always like first getting the frame, like I like this, this design button here, the left and right, it's just like there, the height was like not right, so you have to help to adjust to lift it. And uh, again, uh, I like close-ups in between. On this restaurant, we, we have several wide angle shots, but it's always important that you have a wide, a medium, and might a close-up to, to show different elements, to, do, to show a little bit more the emotions. And on this shot, it's always like a little bit about the symmetry as well. Um, by the way, if we have some questions and answers on the end, but in between, if somebody has a question, just raise your hand, because maybe it's for me interesting and for sure interesting for somebody else as well. Which is a very nice or very important or like for exterior shots, you have it like you need in the sorry. Uh, yes, there will come some samples done with the light specific for where I put the light. This is now just a quick overview and then we go into this technical part about continuous light and the strobe lighting. But the light is the most important, like um, as you may might uh, read in the beginning, like photography is this French word, but it actually came from the Greek and it means drawing this light. So without light, there is no photograph. And Again, uh, this one of the photo, like it's called the blue hour, as you might know. But unfortunately, the blue hour is not one hour long. It's roughly around 20 minutes. Me personally, I like this time very much because where you start seeing the, 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 the inside and the sky is getting this blue, there's some photographers that say, oh, the morning blue hour is much nicer than the evening blue hour, mm, where I must say, from my image, it's difficult to tell, was it the morning or the evening blue hour? Me personally, I don't like the morning blue hour because if there's a city somewhere in the background, there are less lights on, so it's like the cities are more sleeping. On the evening, the city is lit up. If you are somewhere out, if I would do this in the morning blue hour, okay, I can get the engineering to, to switch on all the lights, but I have to frame the picture when it's still dark, so I'm not really seeing exactly what is on the picture compared to the evening. I see this in daylight, I know exactly, okay, this is my frame, and I just have to wait that the light goes down and down. Again, you need various different images because when it's the perfect time, 
for getting inside here, very often the foreground already losing the light and too dark. So it's again you need different exposures to get layered into one image. And again, it's my favorite time, this blue hour. Um, for example, this shot it was not actually a planned shot. It was just like after doing this previous shot, I just turned around and I've seen this is this jetty. Even if it, this is dark, but sometimes this silhouette is just interesting. It's more about this beautiful sky, what is possible. The silhouette of this typically Manidivian boat. So silhouettes can be also nice. It not always have to show everything perfectly lit, because it's more about two yellow lines guiding your eye to the horizon and it's it's a very nice shot in between. Again different uh, this is this is inside shots now, but also with the lights here there's a nice light inside, but I had to add the light you see up here, the light you see on the wall, here on this greenery, and even this spot of light was light from my side. So my assistant, she was standing behind the corner, had the light, and she was just like painting this light on the sock. Otherwise it would have been very, very dark. Here this light was natural from the little spot, but this one was from our side, and I had my lights beside my camera to add a little bit, a highlight here and down this. The remaining are just the beautiful light, how it, how it had. When I was arriving in Oman for this property, they, they showed me this cabana during the daylight and it looked really, really ugly, I must say. It was, it was not nice at all. It was like, looked quite old, like um, everything was like, you could tell it had some years. So it obviously was the my decision, we have to do this in the blue hour. Because they wanted to show the, the, the rocks in the back. I said, okay, the blue hour, it's still possible to see because many people often they, they think blue hour is when the sky is already black. Or sometimes I see people taking photos, cityscapes somewhere in Dubai, and the sky is already black. For me, if the sky is black, it's for me already, my day is, is, is done. Because when this blue is away from the blue hour, it loses the, 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 the beauty for me. And blue and, and orange is a very high color contrast. It's one of the strongest contrasts, even like in painting, graphic design, it's the strongest contrast is this is orange, yellow to the blue. And this is a perfect blue hour. And in the blue hour, this during the daylight not nice cabana turns out to be quite nice. So you, ha you have these lights. Again, I had to play with my light to highlight certain areas. I tried to avoid to highlight in this case here because it was not so beautiful, but the image turned out then to be a very nice image. And very often what happens to me when I travel to, to, to different countries, if I ask the people, oh, when is the blue hour? They look at you with big eyes. Um, I don't know. So that's the reason I have on my phone, I have an application. It's this is called Sun Surveyor. There are many different applications available where I can tell you exactly according to your location when is the blue hour. The blue hour starts, for example, from 7.25 to 7.47. So then I can plan my schedule, my day. Because if I arrive in... Uh, Nigeria or in the Maldives, I don't know when is the blue hour. When they tell me the sunset, I can tell a little bit approximately where it is, but this application tells you exactly. And even this application, they have this feature through your camera, you can tell where's the bust of the sun. Because very often you, if you arrive, you don't know exactly where the sun will be at three o'clock in the afternoon. Then you can then you can tell is the sun coming into the room or not. So the, this application nowadays they're really, really handy especially for the blue hour because nobody nobody knows in their own countries when is the blue hour. Um, this per se is not my favorite image, but it was quite an interesting one because this client, he wanted to have it from this perspective that they could see this the sunrise there. And this was one of the few exceptions I had to do a morning blue hour. Otherwise I'm only doing it if they're if I'm stuck abroad and there are too little evenings, so I have to do it in the morning. And here we went on the day before, it's in Kazakhstan, it was winter, minus 20 degrees or something. And where we took the photo from was a construction. And this construction was on level 20. And the day before we went there, we went up with this construction lift to check this off. 
that's perfect, is it? At 7 o'clock in the morning, the workers are here, the lift starts, you can go up, and the morning blue hour was like 7, 10, something around this, and I said, okay, just about perfect and done. Next day in the morning, you come there, minus 20 degrees, you go there, they said, oh, sorry, the, the, the lift is not working, something broke down, and you then uh, we had to take the camera, my assistant was with me, he was heavily smoked, so he tried left behind. I had to start running up 20 floors by minus 20 degrees. Each floor you can see a little bit, the morning light is coming a little bit more. So it was like <laughs> running against the time just to come up there to reach in the last second, putting up heavy breathing to be able to take the photo. But these are the small things coming along in, in, in photography. So let's come to the the technical part. Um, I, I'm working personally on Canon, so like if somebody of you works with Nikon, it's equivalent, uh, also with almost the same on uh, on Nikon. Um, the lens which I have missing on here is the 2470, so I'm using the 2470 lens also very often, but I wanted to have these two images on it, because there you can see this the lower row is all the tilt and shift lenses. For example, Canon has this 17 millimeter and this 24 millimeter. So this is a normal way, and there you can see it when it's like when it's used, when it's like tilted. So you can see it, you can tilt, you can shift, and it gives you a little bit more range to, to keep vertical lines straight. Not as much as the large format cameras. Or if you're somewhere inside and you have a mirror, you can you can tilt uh, shift the lens a little bit so you're not showing yourself in the mirror because the camera the lens is a little bit off center, and the tilting if you have to point up or down, you just keep the back the whether the sensor is vertically straight, and the verticals in the image will be straight. And um, I said they're manual focus, but um, I don't bother about the manual focus because with live view, you can focus nicely. Which was me a very nice day when Canon released this 1124 lens. It's not so long, it's maybe three years now, or just about three years. You will say, oh, it's only f f4. But um, <laughs> the, the range of this lens is except exceptional, and the lens quality is, is amazing in f4. Again, I don't care. I have the lens on a tripod. I can use my aperture of 14 or more, so the quality of, of the distortion and operation and chromation, everything, it's, it's amazing quality for me. So it's, it's very expensive lens, but um, as it is with lenses, the more the cost, also the quality is better. They come with a reason the price. And which is also an, uh, an amazing lens, is this 14 millimeter, the, this is a 2.8 prime lens. As you all know, a prime lens is in the end a prime lens. They are perfectly corrected for all the optical mistakes in a beer. And using this 40 millimeter lens, it's just beautiful. I was using previously, before this lens came out on the market, I used quite often the 1635 because it gave you a little bit more range in this, uh, especially for Dell photography, sometimes this zoom lens is quite a benefit, like the 14 is amazing, but sometimes you just need this extra little one or two millimeter from which this lens offers, and it saves my life and it saves, it saves the picture. And this 1635 is now not in my travel kit anymore because I'm using this 1124 and the 2470, so like it's covering everything. Depending on the project, I will take maybe this one with me, even I know there's some uh, tricky exteriors, I will take this one with me. Sometimes the 40 millimeter, but it depends again on the project, and in the very end I will show you then my the kit I'm usually using for traveling, because I'm traveling a lot, and it's all about how much equipment you take, the, the weight, the how comfortable it is. And so that's the reason I'm deciding on project if these two coming with me or not. If it's a project here in Dubai, it's different. If I have more, more equipment, it doesn't matter. Um, I don't know which is the widest lens now for Nikon. Is it the 14 millimeter? 
I don't know the shift with the normal wide angle. 14. 14, 20, yeah. There's also fixed lens 14, isn't it? A prime lens. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's comparable with this one. They're like prime lens is a prime lens, makes the quality always better. Yes. I try to avoid to shoot with 11. Um, it happened a few times. I had to use it, but it's more about 12, 13. This can happen on 11. It is possible. So if you have this, uh, this aperture, you, the corners are still good. But the dangerous thing is things close to a lens getting always distorted. So this area we de distort on Photoshop. So we select only like the last 20% and we de distort it back. But I used it quite a few times, and I'm very, very pleased for because five years ago, it would not have been possible. Yeah. Um, it's not starting, it's not, not, it's not getting like in this distortion, but like there's some wretches, if things are closed, yeah. But the, the, it's not like getting this barrel or the blurry corners or dark corners. So for this one, it's very, very good um, made. So no dark corners, the, the, the sharpness in the corners, still very, very good. And it's only about like uh, this table would get like a little bit more rectangular if it's very close to the lens. But everything which if you try to avoid being very close to something, 11, it's, yes. Yes. Um, they have a, If you're on the very edge of tilt and shift together, you're getting some corners where it's quite a little bit, the, the, the sharpness decreases. So, but um, you have to crop it a little bit then, yes, ideally. Or you have to consider it with, with your perspective. But if you, if you use it with a normal lens, you have to distort the image again, so you, you lose again. And it's like, um, it's always a difference if it's real captured depictions or if it's like manipulated pixels. So it's like, um, still, I prefer this version than overly distorting and stretching it in Photoshop. So for the, for the basic camera settings, like, um, more or less, this could be a camera setting which I'm using. Um, one big topic between photographers very often, are you using it in AV? Or you using it in manual? Like um, Ivana, my dear friend of photographer, she is using it in manual. I'm using it in AV, but it's like there's no better or worse. It's just like what you're used to it. Like the benefit why I'm using it in AV, it's especially also in travel photography or like inside, the calculation from the camera is quite good. So if I focus on this one with AV and the aperture is on uh, let's say eight. In this light situation, the camera is already there. So, but if there's something very quickly and I turn there and it's much brighter, the camera is calculating for me already roughly I'm right. And I can make a quick shot and I'm almost there. If I'm a manually, I have first to, 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 to change also the, the, the shutter speed. So with AV, you're already there. And I just adjust with the over and under compensation. This is it's my way. So some people, they prefer being on, on manual and adjusting manual. So it's like no better or wrong. It's just what you used to it. Like, um, as you see here, the ISO 100. Um, ISO is, again, it's quite a big topic because um, there's a, also a small difference between Canon and Nikon. There's about each camera has its native ISO, the base ISO. Like, for, for Canon, it is 100 is the, the native ISO. That means if you have to increase the ISO, the ideal, you use 100, 200, 400, or more. With Nikon, it's around 160, so it would be 160, 320, 640, and, and go up. So, so because what, what the camera does, if I go on 160 ISO, it's like putting it on 200 ISO and bringing it a little bit underexposed out. So it's not a real 160. Again, these differences are very, very, very small. You some people making a religion out of it and say, oh, like, it makes a big difference. Some people say less. For me, it's like, um, 
I try to use it, but I don't have any problems to put it in 150 or 250, but if I can, I try to, to keep it on 100 or 200 on this native ISO, because the dynamic range of the sensor is the biggest with 160. The higher you go with the ISO, apart from grain, the dynamic range also gets a little bit less. And for me, for interior photography, the camera is on a tripod. So if the shutter speed is half a second or one and a half second, I don't care. But the dynamic range, yes, if I can have a little bit more, why not? As also like for me, aperture 14 is like an aperture. Is the main aperture I'm using in general for, an, for a room, if it's not too vast, too big, around 14, this is the aperture I'm using. And also like I'm most of the time, I'm on manual focus because as I said, I'm connected to my laptop on the live view. I, I make manual focus because if you keep on out of focus and you make various images and the out of focus just changes between a little bit and you layer the photos afterwards in Photoshop, it feels like a slightly difference in zoom. It, as you would zoom the images a little bit if the focus is getting a different point. They're not accurate to lay above each other layers. If you're in manual focus and you lay the images, they're always exactly the same. It makes your life easier in Photoshop and saves you a little bit time. Um, I personally, I have the Wi-Fi not on on the camera. I only use it sometimes if it's a really tricky small, small bathroom and my long wire, like the five meter wire, is not able to go under the door or around. So then I connect my camera's Wi-Fi to my laptop and I still can control it from my laptop and make the exposure there. With the big raw files, it takes a little bit time, but still it's, it's better than being somewhere squeezed in by myself in a little bathroom. It's nicer to stand outside and wait this one second for the image to come. Um, just a few, few, like this was, I love since this is the, the, this balance level is introduced in the cameras. This was just like a, three, four weeks ago in a project in Nigeria. But for me, it's very important, especially shooting with wide-angle lenses, that the camera is exactly balanced. Because if the camera just tilts up, points up a little bit, your vertical lines are not straight anymore. And for me, interior or architectural images where the vertical lines are not straight is, is horrible. Except you do it on an on on artistic purpose that you want to have them, it's fine. But you want to do a normal interior shot, and the vertical lines are not straight, it's, it's simple to avoid. So this is a very nice tool, even on, on if you have the camera, you see my camera is always connected, even you see the same on the, on the laptop. The only time you don't see this, if you on uh, shooting a video, or if you have the face recognition or face tracking on, then this leveling is, is not available. What I'm using also very often on my camera is like, where you manually can change the white balance. I, I'm using very often the auto white balance, or except on the blue hour in the evening, I know exactly with the Kelvin, I know it starts by just above 4,000, and in the perfect blue hour, it goes down to 3,500. But otherwise, with this auto balance, it's very fine. And if I think oh, it's a little bit too yellow, I just do it manually a little bit in the opposite, and it's there where I want to have it. I think this is si very similar to Nikon. Um, I assume every one of you uses RAW file. I think we don't have to discuss RAW separately of the benefits and the differences. Um, the thing that I'm using, of course, all the time, the RAW. The only exception is because I'm using sometimes the HDR mode. Because the, the final HDR images are JPEG images. I'm using mainly HDR because I have always clients beside my side and they cannot imagine in the same way if they see a photo or the bright areas will be more visible in the final image. If I take a HDR image, they already see a little bit more, ah, okay, how it almost will look on the final way from the different exposures outside, inside, so they can imagine better what I'm doing. So on the raw file alone, it's for non-photographers, sometimes difficult to understand how it will look like. 
And I think Nikon also has this, this, this um, HDR. Like um, this, down, this two down there, I think I never even, even used it because they're just too faithful artistic. It's not really like for commercial photography. But uh, it has quite a, and I'm using this HDR as well because all the interior, I need bracketing, I need different exposures. If I'm on HDR, I always say it, it keeps all the original RAWs which we use for the post-production. So it's like an easy way for me doing bra bracketing and having a nice image already to get it there. Um, what I really love as well as on Canon, like this software, the EOS Utility and uh, this photo professional, it comes with every DSLR camera. So if, if you have a Canon and you never use it, look at it, you can download it. And this is the software where you can connect your camera with the laptop. And Nikon has a software, but I think we, it costs us a small amount, but still there are some third parties, companies which are also offering software. And it's handy, especially for architecture photography, because like on a screen, you can see much, much more than on the small LCD on the back of the camera. You, you see, oh, I missed a little bit here, I missed that. And uh, again, you have the, uh, most of the time, you'll have the clients around, so you, they can see this view on, on the laptop, like on the back of the screen. It's quite difficult. Like, an, there you can see, this is like a screenshot of my laptop, same as here. I can do the, all the control from the whole camera on my laptop. So if the camera is standing there and the wire is here, I don't have to go there to change. I can change everything from the computer and see the results immediately. Um, here you see like it's the same as the ISO 100, the aperture is 14. Here the aperture is a little bit more open because on purpose it should be not too much sharp outside. It should have a slightly getting less focus. But in general, is around 14. This is for like for, for a scene like this. It's an aperture I do like a lot. And here you can see the white balance was on Kelvin because um, I was waiting for the blue hour and with the Kelvin I can just, uh, I know how to adjust my Kelvin. It, it's by viewing. If you see the screen, if it's too, too warm, I can make it nicer, a little bit more, more blue. So this is now getting now the very interesting part then about the difference in light. These are the two main things, like an atmosphere evening shot where you use the tungsten light or LED, but the LED lights only when you can change the color temperature. Like LED light in daylight temperature, it's not helpful. So it should be going down to, to 3,400 Kelvin from the color temperature. So like this is, for example, the, the light I'm using, and uh, this would be an LED light, which you can change the, the, the color temperature. On the other hand, the other style is this, where, where you see like a room and it has this feeling, it's all just about daylight. It should look like there's no other light source used. Like uh, in the very old days, people would have put the strobe there behind to create light effect. It doesn't look nice. so it should should look as natural as possible. The only thing, I need some strobe to get this transition nice. I will show you then on some samples later on because the outside is a different exposure than the inside. And when the outside is the right exposure, this window frame is just all black. And between these black window frames and the outside, putting this in Photoshop together to make it creating the masks in there is quite a little bit of pain, a little bit nightmare. You have to work so carefully, otherwise you always see some, some black lines or black blitzes, highlights, it's very difficult. If I use the strobe, I use the strobe for this area mainly. And this is like, um, I'm using the Prophoto uh, strobe and this is also on battery, the D1. So for me, I dry all my light. Also this light, it's I'm using it as battery. For me, I try to have all my light on battery power. Not like that I'm somewhere, I have to find an extension. There's a power plug, oh no, the next power plug is outside. It took quite a lot of extra time. You need a good extension wiring. So nowadays it's fine. Everything can be like on battery. 
So this is on, on battery, this is on battery, and this lasts more than nothing. So on the next screen, now we can see here why I was using the light. On this image of this restaurant, it's again my favorite blue hour. I was using the light because otherwise the chair would not have highlights. So the lights were here on the back of the chair to get them. And also it was a little bit on this area. The top of the table, I didn't need anything because there was lights on the ceiling. It was already a very nice light from the restaurant. Also, like when we switched off the all the lights to get less reflections, I used had to use the light a little bit on the frame to not making it too black, that it looks a little bit natural. So it's very often back of the chairs to, to lift a little bit this 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 light. Because this light you did, for example, is a levy on the side, you can change between spotlight and floodlight. So you can really point it. And with the barn doors, you can make it very small and really like direct it. And on this image, you will see later on the retouch sample how it looks that the strobe was only used for this area so that I could blend in the outside image with, with this area. All this what is getting gradually brighter in here, even in this area, it's not from the strobe, it's just from overexposure, one, one step more, one step more, and then combining. So like this area is one image, this is one, so it's like at least normally four to five images to combine for the one perfect image. And the end result is then it looks natural. It looks like a, this is just the daylight coming in. So it's always a little bit brighter on the window. It gets a little bit darker in here. You just lift a little bit this. Otherwise, the shadow would be too strong and too dark. And people think, yeah, this was just going in, captured, and this is the image. I wish it would be like this, but it's quite more behind, but it should look natural. So I will show you now a few more samples how I, I play with light or I paint with light. Like this is quite a huge restaurant area. There are some nice little lamps here which not creating a lot of light. Here this light, yes, they create. But to making it as nice as appealing, you can see I had to add light light here in this area. Back in the many, many years back I've seen photographers, they had this with this tungsten light, especially in a room photo, when they were capturing this side of the room, they had like the wall you couldn't see on the image, like a huge rug and they put maybe like 10, 15 little lights on it, each one was pointing on one single, single area. It looked quite nice and amazing then, but um, the time this photographer needed to assemble this rug and all these lights to get this one shot is enormous. So it takes three, four hours or more to take this one photo. And for me, like I, I know I have to use several layers in Photoshop and already I decide always on location what takes less time. Either I fix it on, on location with many lights or I play with one, two lights on various areas and combine them in Photoshop. So whatever is less work for the workflow will be the way I go. And that's the reason it's very important that you as a photographer, you also know how post-production Photoshop works. There are quite some photographers, they outsource their, their um, post-production only. And if you don't understand how it works, you might make some mistakes. And in the end, they take much more time or almost not able to fix it. So in this case, I only had two lights and I was like my assistant and I, we always had like highlighting this and this and then the next this and this, then the next this and this. And then we had to combine all these images to get this, this together, if we go one back, that it looks like a oh, natural light. But here you can see, this is a natural light comes here, but this up here, this is the additional light. And it should be also used in a way that it's not very obvious from the beginning. Like here, this light up here was already from the all these nice big spots there. We moved them, arranged them a little bit lift left and right, but they came nicely in here. For, uh, it's another example for this image. Um, this light here on the top of the table was quite nicely given from the chandelier, but still there were seen quite many dark areas. So now just try to have a guess where, 
where the light everywhere was, was set. Let's look at the image observed. Where, the, where spots they might have been added? Oh, what? Uh, this one you mean, man? Yeah, yeah. I guess you can. Wait, there's. We added here behind to get a little bit there, especially in front of this chair, because like, if you have some brighter areas on the far end, it uh, it lets the image appear with more depth. So everything what is getting a little bit bright over to the end gives a little bit more more depth to the image. What we so we had to highlight a little bit the chairs here, the floor, some highlights here. A small because I, f I, f I found it too too dark and gray here, so I added just a little light here, a little bit. Wait, I go back on the when you can see it, and and then I can as hardly can see here. It's a little bit the reflection of the curtain, so we, we kept a little bit the reflections of the curtain. Um, this is the light you've seen before in the dunks on the left down corner. It comes on the very end of my my travel gear, you can see it again. It's just like this small of a light. I know I'm holding it. Yes, like that. And then I'm 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 always say I'm painting with light. So it's just like if you look to the the, 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 the point like pointer, I'm never standing still. I'm always moving him slightly. So you're not getting a sharp corner of the shadow. It's always like soft. Yes. No, no, this was more Exactly, it's the beam light, I have the barn doors on, on spot, so I can make it as small as possible so you can just highlight it. Oh, this, this was for sure uh, like three, four seconds. No, 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 this is like at least at least a second or one and a half seconds, but the uh, ISO very low in 100, the aperture around 14, and something around this, yeah. And... Um, in general, I, I don't care so much about the dial. So, like um, for me, it's important the aperture I choose for the depth of field, and the ISO I keep always. It's around 100. I keep it lower, not not going lower. Um, no, I'm not calculating time. I let the camera calculate. So I put an aperture 14. The camera calculates, and if the camera calculates wrong, like it's because it's like too dark in the back and the camera makes it too bright, I correct it with the over and under exposure. I say, okay, camera, your calculation, minus two thirds, and then we start. I have to make exposures far darker because on the exposure where it's in overall right for the room, the chandeliers would be blown out. So again, this is like in a daylight shot, you need different exposures that it looks natural, that you get some details in here that you get it should be dark, but you should see a little bit still the structure here. So it's like, again, composing with various images to make one out of it. Um, I just got a signal. I think we should make a, a short break now. And we continue right now after here.
So everyone is ready to to restart again. Okay, welcome back. Let's let's continue where we stopped. So the last image was here with with the tungsten light to highlight certain areas. Uh, I always call it like playing with painting with light, making a little bit more atmosphere. The natural, because the natural light is not giving us the light where we always want to have it. So any questions to the light right now? Because now we're going a little bit further. So one part is styling. Like um, I don't know which kind of architecture photography you're doing or you're looking into it. Like for me, I'm doing it for high-end hotels. And each hotel, as mentioned before, they have their guidelines. So they give me quite a, like 50, 60 pages. They're very strict with angle, twos and knots. And they have quite some differences. Um, I try to capture it a little bit as an overall. Like what is for me very important, like a natural angle, like a balanced lens, as I told you before, so that the, the verticals are straight. Like for me, the verticals they should be really straight, otherwise it looks very odd. The natural angle, like as I said, like for, for bed, this, this angle is quite natural because the dimensions is nice. If it's too close to a wide angle lens, it's getting quite distorted. Um, like for example here, when I start setting up a frame, I'm looking first, okay, is it good from here? I always try, out of experience, I know exactly in the here room, this is perfect, but still, I try to go to the other side, to the other corner. I try to go to this corner, to this, to, to see the same thing from almost all possible ways. Because sometimes I'm still surprised. Oh, hold on. I thought it's nice from there, but it actually looks better from here. So don't miss a good shot, because you were too lazy to check it from different angles. And then when I know, OK, this is the angle I want, because we wanted to show the mountains outside in the blue, the blue hour. For me, the first I start, OK, my left and what is my right frame or ending of the picture because the, the, the ceiling or the floor is for me secondary so because ceiling I always can, can crop it away because it's not the important part the important part is is what you see from left to right like here if you notice I framed it with just showing like partially a little bit of the DV so showing this little of the DV is more than enough everyone sees it recognizes oh there's a DV. If more of the DV here, this wall gets very, very long. And if you shoot a room showing too much from, from three walls, that it's not good for the picture. It's getting less interesting. If I shoot it from more and then in the center, it gets like a tunnel view. So it's like it's, it's not appealing. It's not, it's not nice. So ideally, I always try to show one wall more the view and this one, if I show the wall, as little as possible. So generally you can say um, if it doesn't look right for you on the screen, then most probably it is not right. Then try something. Just check it once more. I might do high, I might do low, I might do shall I try a little bit more for the left, a little bit more for the right, until it feels more right. If it's movable furniture, just try to move things. If you don't like it, if you like it less, you can put it back, but you tried it. Like, um, as a main rule of thumb, I see very often images, 
the deck from far too low to the bed looks massive. For me, my ideal height of the camera is approximately this height is the camera for me. This is the average. I hardly go higher because if you go higher, you start looking more like down. The bed is getting massive. If you go too low, you see less of the top of the bed and this area is getting massive. So you just have to try and you have to learn to trust your, your eyes, your feeling. So what we can try with that this height is an average good height for, for a camera. And some images will be different, sometimes you need higher low, but as an average it's good. Um, as I said, it's framing left to right. Um, choose the light for the look and feel you want to achieve. If it's a daylight, you don't need the tungsten light, then you need a strobe. And even if it's like daylight, like for example in this image, it's, it's very nice in daylight, but I, like for this brand, they don't want to show sun rays in the room. So it would not be approved from the brand. But if I take photos of this and the headquarters, and they were not approved, I would not be happy, the client would be not happy. So and in general, if you have sun rays in the room, it's always getting more tricky for because of light, shadows, the, the contrast, the dynamic range. It can be nice, but it's more difficult. So that's the reason I have to choose the time of the day where the sun is outside, but not inside the room. The best light in the room is just before or after the sun goes in or out of the room. Um, this is the light. The minimal propping only. Like in a hotel, usually here, there would be like a notepad, there's some collaterals, there's some uh, the telephone, alarm clock, a lot of lot of things, magazines, timeout, all these things. I I remove most of them because um, if you check in the room, yeah, it's nice, it's there, but on a photo, it is distracting, it's making me more busy, and less is more. And especially there's like you have many items already, and if it's everywhere crowded, the eye needs to have empty spaces to to rest, to calm down, to declutter. Uh, like <laughs> this kind of shots, quite tricky because it's about um, symmetry. Like and the setup, like um, in the theater style, it's about that these chairs all like to, to to tell the people when they set up, take a rope. Start with the center ropes, big, big ropes, so all in the same line. And it is difficult for them to set it up right. Very often, chairs are like a little bit not the same as the backs because it's heavy people sitting in a chair, even if it's aligned nicely. You see the difference in the photo because the, the back is like a little bit bent. So then when they set up nicely, it's then for me going there or my assistant, I tell them, okay, fifth row, this chair, move it a little bit to the left, the right. So the arranging can take quite some time. To take this photo goes very quickly. So like um, the ac actual capturing is maybe two minutes or three minutes or four minutes. But the setup can take a really long time. It can be I had it already three hours as well. The, um, this was because the support. In general, like for a room shot like this or this, you can calculate, you or I calculated, I'm quite a fast moving photographer, like uh, I can do it in, in a half an hour or, or something like this, but in general, I tell my client, in one day, I can take, like say, seven to 10 images, once they are perfect images. If you have like, um, in one room, several angles, then it could be okay, you can go faster, but seven to 10 images, then it must be already very, very nice prepared from the client. I give them always like a pre-preparation list. For example, if you look here, the bed, it looks very nice and neat. This is not the way how it looks when you check in in a hotel. There's always wrinkles, there's for guest check-in, but for photo shoot, the camera sees every little wrinkle. So I always tell them before, rest the, the bed sheets different perfectly, starch the pillows, and even then if you come sometime, you have to tell them, okay, you have to redo it again. Some wrinkles will always remain. Some 
we always want to keep in the image, otherwise it starts looking artificial or like a rendering. But um, so like still you have to try to make it as good as possible on location. Like for example, like this wrinkle is a bit easy to remove on Photoshop, but it's getting artificial. So keep some, but not too much, otherwise it starts looking messy and not right. Like here this is they, they made it quite perfect, so we, we still kept a few little things. But it still look, looks looks natural. When you see the wires, like very often there's telephones or from the lights, and the wires just take a tape, tape it up to the under the desk. So everything what you can avoid there is less work in Photoshop. When everything is destructing on the end, you realize, oh, why didn't I remove the dustbin? So it would is easier to remove the dustbin to hide it behind there or putting it out. It takes 10 seconds in Photoshop. It might take a little bit. It depends on your skill, more or less. Um, with very difficult, it's very often launches, restaurants, where there's a lot of furniture. There's like a, a, a room, a bedroom, much easier because there's like even even here, like to move this chair or to arrange this this one. This is normally like turned in. So for the photo, I turned it out a little bit. We removed, there were been four or five pillows. I removed half of them so that just, so we see, okay, there are pillows, but if there are four pillows, it looks overloaded, it's not right. Still, there's some things to move. The bed, you can't move much. But if you're in a restaurant, it's sometimes a different game. Like in, in both restaurants, there have been almost double the amount of tables. Same here, there have been more furniture in here Let's go back to this one. So like now you can see the table, this table you can see now is this still overlapping a little bit. It's unavoidable, but it looks like height you can fit. The original furniture, it would be just like chairs and tables. You don't see it is overlapping the other one. And overlapping furniture is not really ideal. You can't but we removed a lot of things in here and it still looks like there's a lot of space, it's inviting, you want to sit there, but it's cluttering, try to declutter. If there's a lot of furniture, move it out, and you will see it looks better. At the beginning, some clients there, but yeah, you want a nice photo or not? If, if people go there, they will not realize that on the photo there was less furniture than in, in real life. So, this is the, the important thing, like I was like here, like just showing from the frame a little bit. I didn't want to show a whole table. If I would show more tables, I would create here a very empty space. And an empty space on the floor is not nice. If you have somewhere an empty space in, in, in the wall, it's nice. It's okay. But here, an empty space would have been very ugly. So that's the reason that if you I just show half a day, half of a table, automatically if you see like a cropped table, you know, ah, it goes further. You don't have to explain. Everyone associates, oh, the restaurant is bigger. And you just see, okay, it's there. If it's cropped image here, you might would not realize it goes further. Here you just get the idea, it continues. Same thing is here, you just like, you have to show a little bit of this sofa. You don't have to show the whole sofa because it would be like a very huge area. It's all about this, this feeling, how close can I go or how much I have to show. It's a very fine line, it's just right. To move it left and move it right, especially furniture which is very close to the camera, is very difficult because they appear bigger than they are. In another way, like these are some samples for these do not. Like if you see like this, the here the verticals are very nice and straight, but the curtains look like messy. The bed is extremely wrinkly. It's also, like here, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's uh, it's something for me like uh, pillows and curtains are not my best friends because they are always always in a mess. But if you work with housekeeping in the hotels, after the first day they realize, ah, okay, this is what he means. So on the second day, the beds are very nicely and perfectly prepared. Like on this image, if if you look at it, like um, for me, first thing is like the verticals are not vertical. For me, the angle personally, it's, it's too low. And the 
window, it looks to me like a photo or poster, not like a, like a window. It's totally artificial. Here, this is, would be for me too much overlapping. The same thing down here. Here, the vertex, yeah, still the verticals are not really, but like, there's no need of, of this one. There's no need of, of this. Here, there's a door handle in the picture. This is something we need to do to, to remove. It's a little bit much played with the lights on there. Again, the view just doesn't look like really right. Like these two examples, is also like if you shoot vertically like a lobby from above, it's just too much floor and it looks strange. The same if you the camera is too low, half of the picture is just the, 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 the floor. Uh, okay, it's a nice reflection, but it's not showing the space or the, the room. And for me, we remove, like in the ceiling, this sprinkler or smoke detectors, we remove them in Photoshop because like um, nobody, nobody's missing. The spots, yes, we keep, but they are very often too much stuff and just makes an image busy. And you look at something and you think something is not right. But these if you would remove it, it would look <sighs> more calm. Just a little bit more things. So um, we go now some more of my images portfolio and like in a few images I will, I will point out a few things what we what we did and not did before we come to the next topic. For example, like on, on this room, like here would be normally the TV, the bed and everything. It was very busy. And for this client, with, with, with Carlton, they have like, you're not allowed to show a TV on a room image. Because they know everyone goes and there is Carlton, they know I have a flat screen TV. So I no need to show, which is for me good, because it, you can focus more on the calmness of the image. There's no any anything on the, on the ceiling. It's just like simple, nothing there. One flower, no two with the window. This is again like a um, very simple. We remove all this, the telephone, alarm clock. You don't need, you, you know that it's there. And you look at it and you can focus, the eye can focus on, on, on the bed. And this kind of curtains is also is very difficult to get nice, these things nicely, a little bit of the shears. Here the fuse inside out is in post-production a little bit more difficult because you have this metal fence inside. Sorry? Yes, I kept the lamps there because I, I like them because there is like because we have two flowers already here. If this wouldn't be not there, I would crop the image maybe from here, put the two flowers there. It would be also a possible solution. But um, I like this stand and we're showing this because here's a nice element from the room to frame, left and right the same. So it shows a little bit more of the space because people then are it's a big room. So we did also like as a second shot, a, a closer one, where it's more based on the view. There's a similar sample coming then soon. So we can probably try to do the wide angle and the close up. Like this is a, a in the opposite way because like the, the showing the connectivity to, 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 to the bathroom. There's a lot of furniture. There's another connectivity, the wardrobe walking in. So like this chair, it is difficult to do. So we moved with this chair, we played, I think, half an hour. A little bit more left to the front, right. It never looked right. So we had to keep it on the way it is. And here we had to keep more pillows because this is more for the client, a request to show the, because of their clientele. But again, we removed all these collaterals, telephone, alarm clock, left and right. Just a simple flower. Flower is always good if they're simple. White and green works perfectly. If you put flowers there with five different colors, it's distracting your view again. Flowers is nice to have there, but they should be not in the foreground. Like here, if you not look at them, if you not point out, you not even realize they're flower, flowers. If they're like have many colors, you look at them. So it should be something subtle just in the background. Like this is an angle which is taken very rare over the bed, over this side. I could do it because it was enough space for me to be away. And it was important to show the big view. And here, the, on this side, the view was not nice because there was this building and how come the construction. So 
So then it's nice to keep the shears a little bit closed. But in general, if you take a photo and you have all the curtains or shears closed, it looks like you're hiding something. So there might be sometimes the exception that if there's really nothing outside, then take it opposite that you try to avoid the window. But in general, if it's closed, it's like, it's not nice. It's like, what are you hiding? Like again, for, for, for this image, we, it was difficult to find the right angle because like it's, it's not an ideal angle, but here you can see, okay, this is the view, this is the Bosporus in, in Istanbul, and you see the space behind the working desk. This is not a very nice frame. It would be easy for us to, to, to Photoshop with readers to frame away, but uh, the client wants to keep the door because it's access to a little terrace. Here was again, it was very important to do the scouting when we arrived. We, I got the photograph of this by email before, like this king room, this suite, blah, blah, blah. But only when I arrived from the hotel, with the housekeeping ideally and with the marketing lady, we make the tour. Then I can see, oh, this is the room. Then I can check, okay, this most of the time is an application or if she knows the sun is there. Because with this client again, it would be not allowed to have the sun directly into the room. So I chose a time where the sun is still out there on the terrace because if this would be in shadow, it would be very dark and not nice. Now it's a little bit, I wish they would have a different color of furniture, but I can't change it, they have it like this. So the sun was still there and no sun inside. So the room looks more even, which is according to the guideline of this client. Some clients, they like the sun, but I said, it's, if you're not bounded by guidelines, you can drive the sun, you can play nicely, but it's at the beginning, if you're not very, very confident, it's easier to shoot if there's no sun straight in the room because it looks more even and you have less troubles. Again, here, if you realize, we just put one flower, we, we, we just, not white in this case because it would have been not nice here, but some purple, which is like a little bit the same color. Here the client requested this evening shot, which we or I usually hardly do because in general hotels want to have daylight shots from their room, but we had the daylight, so they wanted just to have the additional in the evening. Then again, here and here, it's the same thing, playing with the tungsten light on a very small beam to highlight this area. Also like a little bit on this chair. Here this is just moved out slightly that you can see not too far, otherwise it would be overlapping. All the wires are hidden. There's additional also light here in the flower, so they just like to break up a little bit this dark, dark corner. If you were thinking, now, oh, here the verticals are not straight, it's like the mirrors are really in this way, so it's like um, the mirrors are bent. The room itself would be photographed straight. And this is sometimes like it's nice to, if you have something beautiful, vast design like here, show space. Here, much more space than I usually would give this room this table. Usually my frame would be maybe like just here and a few, but with this beautiful chandelier and this massive mirror, sometimes make it, make it grand, make it big, give, give it space. And again, it's, it's my favorite blue hour. And again, here I had to play with this additional light on the bottom. This is an exceptional big bathroom, and bathrooms sometimes can be a little bit tricky to shoot. I have on the end one sample to show you one thing which is very common, a common problem in bathroom, but this will be then on the retouching sample. So I said, this is quite a big one. It's kind of uh, easier to approach. Like what is very often like uh, surfaces like this, which are like these beautiful surfaces, but they're very reflective and they're showing everything. And very often they are very colorful reflections. So what we often do, we desaturate the reflections so that the reflections are there, but they're not like popping out with colors. They at least have the same color as the original fabric. Um, I usually try to avoid to show the, the, the BD or the, the toilet, but sometimes it's just not possible because of limitation of space. Uh, just the relaxation rooms is always uh, like having nice some symmetry. This was like a spa, it was like, there was nothing there, it was like um, not appealing, not inspirational. So we were walking around in the hotel, we have seen somewhere this bar around, we said, okay, 
it belongs somehow to this bar. We, we brought it in. It gives a nice, but then it's in, I think it was in Bahrain or something. So it has some orient some some feeling. Here again, play with the lights to, pr to highlight it a little bit. Also here, it's just played with the lights. One simple flower, not like you typically be using it very often. It's great with a lot of condiments. It's to arrange and to, to focus. And if you play with the light, you're like this conductor, like, like you have an orchestra. When I put a light here, you will look here. If I put the light here, like into this, you will look to the chairs. So all the things you highlight, the eyes have the tendency to follow to the bright areas in the pictures. So when you make a highlight, you guide the, the viewer, oh, look at this, look at that. So you, you can you can choose where the people should look. In, in meeting rooms, I like to have it symmetry, but sometimes you, you're having the camera there, you're setting it up, you're moving, and you're not getting there until you realize the room looks symmetrical, but the room is not symmetrical. Like, there is a difference in the width. And at the beginning, you're like, oh, cannot be, like, you're moving, you're moving, I can't make it, but then, yeah, okay, you have to deal with it. This happens quite often. But at least like putting like the tables and very nice aligned, the flowers aligned, so it guides there. You have a very strong, you don't need any, any setup here. So usually clients will put a lot of setup with this richness of the room, no needed. I have to show that there's a rich view is outside. It's more the highlighting about the room. You see their windows, so you get the feeling, oh, I have daylight in this room. So sometimes it's enough to show there's a window not necessarily to show the few, the actual few. Again, one of these big ballrooms, which is quite some setting up, and especially if it's not set up nicely to rearrange it, especially if they have, like, they wanted to show these gaps in between, there's one more gap behind, it breaks up the, 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 the nice line of the chair, so this can be quite a lot of time to arrange. Usually, I prefer this here the style to shoot in the opposite direction with standard chairs, but these beautiful chairs look just better from the front. A uh, different, different area for photography. But again, here it's even more important that you, that you know about the time of the day because it's a very small space. There's always a lot of windows that you know when is the sun coming in. Do I want to have the sun or I don't want to have the sun inside? And sometimes it's very difficult if you're there and you're there for five days, how is the weather? So like in this, this, this shoot was in the Seychelles, you see there are quite some clouds. And on the arriving day, we did this scouting. It was a beautiful day. And luckily, I have this habit since a while. Even if I do scouting, I take my camera that I can look through the, through the lens. I was taking a few photos from the pool just for the hand, you have the sky and the blue and the pool. Because the other three days, we had a very bad weather. And the one pool, we haven't had enough good weather. So uh, I made, made a photo of the pool, and I could use from the scouting image the, the area to, to, to blend in. Because like um, you're down there in Seychelles, you have to fly back. Because it's another project, you can't wait to stay until the weather is getting nice. So when you arrive somewhere abroad, try to make always backup image of the view that you have a nice view. If you shoot in rooms inside and it's the whole week raining, you have at least a nice view which you can put into the window. So it is possible in Photoshop. It's not ideal, but still you can deliver the photos you asked for. Otherwise you can have troubles. This was still on the first day where it was like uh, the sky okay. Again, on then this, this with the blue hours, it's like to to get it simple. There's not much in this room, but it, it doesn't need. You don't have too many things on it. Like this for restaurants, it's also sometimes um, it could be very very busy on the on the table. So like for me, the classical salt and pepper, if it's exceptional nice, I keep it. Otherwise, I like to remove it. But this client, he insisted to keep the, the butter blade and knife. This is something very often I suggest, let's remove it. It looks more calm. It is standard if it's there, but sometimes you have to try to make it less. And also, like again, the framing from, from, from left and right, 
I was framing it for left and right and for below, and whatever was remaining on the top was just remaining on the top. If, if this would be a little bit less, a little bit more, I would not bother that much. More, I would drop most probably. And again, you can most probably you can tell by now, there was like some subtle additional highlights on the backs of the chairs. Because otherwise it would have been quite too dark. And it was luckily, you have always, if you have uh, like mirrors around, be always careful. Are you in the mirror? Uh, are you in the in the mirror? I've seen too often images somewhere in magazines or on websites. Uh, you could see the camera or even the photographer. Oh, in the mirror, <laughs> you're still there. So just double check always that nothing is left from you in the picture or from your camera. This is a similar thing as the restaurant before, with totally different property, but again, playing the same thing with, with, with the highlights, try to make some kind of a symmetry. Because I was on this, if you, if I would have shot it from one side, I would have seen one table nice, but I would not see more. So we did one additional shot, just one table, and one the whole restaurant, but this is this medium shot, where you just show nicely, ah, you have this individual base. This again is like a little bit of closer. So what uh, at this time I liked in this way. Today I might put these are the way this reflection is maybe too strong. I would, I would today I would do less reflection. But this is also like something nowadays a little bit less. But in the early days of professional, when I look back to photos I took maybe two years back, I was thinking, oh my god, what have I done there? Because what it was a sign of of development. If you look now back to photos you look a while ago and you don't like them. It's a good sign that means you improve. <laughs> yeah, no, it's no, no, I don't do any sucking. No, no. It's, it's, it's just even average of 14, hardly more. I, because like most of my clients, by, by guidelines, they want to have depth of field. I personally, I like the shots where you have something in the foreground and getting very blurry in the background. So I would never, I hardly would do a stacking because to me, no need. There, there are maybe some things, requirements. Um, here, most probably was focusing here because like, you know when you focus, the first third is in depth of field and two thirds behind in back in field, uh, depth of field. And especially with a wide angle lens, they go very far to the back. So like, um, <coughs> so most probably the focus was, I can't remember, was most probably taken here, or in the, but um, it was anyway quite a close. Um, also here, again, I needed my additional highlights because it was a, it's a beautiful room, but very, very dark. So and I kept it here on purpose, very dark, dark up there, so that all the highlights goes in the center. This light here and here is again with my light added additionally. And then if it's even if it's maybe too strong in the shoot, you can just put it gently as a layer on it. L um, it depends. Um, obviously I try to avoid to create sh ugly shadows. Like for this one, um, I most probably was I was standing from here, from the towels or something, I really try to be just above it, from straight down, because otherwise I would create shadow on the back, or if I would do some back, shadow on the front. So you always have to consider the shadow. That's the reason I'm always like, I'm moving the light. So the more you move, the less sharp gradient you have from the light into the shadow, or you don't create too much shadows. Lobbies can be sometimes very difficult first, very busy with people, and the time of the day you, you shoot it could be like 2 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning, where there's no traffic with people. I personally, I usually, I don't like to shoot from elevated like this that you can see it down. This is in general not my, I don't like it. We did one shot from the lobby down there, but here was just about to show, to show the, 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 the space. And lobbies are always better to shoot on the evening because lobbies have a lot of windows and the daylight is not mixing well with the all the beautiful warm light inside 
and is creating on the camera then like very bluish and the atmosphere is not here. So lobby is always nice in the evening, even if it means stay up long or get up very early. This was the benefit the hotel was not open yet, so it was easier to handle. Like uh, <laughs> this lobby, uh, I've seen a few of you uh, connected on my, on my Instagram, which I'm not using much. I have one video from behind of scenes from this one because uh, we needed to elevate the camera and the tripod was not not tall enough, so we put, we had one of this table, we had, where are these vases? There's some beautiful blue vases, we turned them upside down, then we put the tripod and the camera on top of these vases, so that the camera reached, reached this elevation, because I wanted, of course, I wanted to keep the verticals straight, and I wanted to just to get a little bit of the ceiling that the people imagine the height. On this property, we have this problem if the shoot was in December, so, and the path of the sun in December is shorter than in summer, so this area would never have reached sun, because the sun was just here, but this, everything in the shadow, so like, um, this was one, one of the, the, the samples where I had to use my strobe to lift the shadows up, so that it's still like even, and a little bit lift, otherwise, the shadows would have been very dark, very cold, not nice. And with just overexposure, it would have been too less. So that's always nicer to add like the strobe, ideally from a little bit from camera direction, to, to can lift this a little bit up. So you, I was walking around, strobe here, strobe there, strobe here, strobe here. Same as with the tungsten, but here the daylight with the strobe. No, it's many exposures. Like uh, this is one exposure for the overall, and plus different um, images where I use the strobe to get the bits and pieces together, because the strobe is not strong enough. Even if it's a very powerful pro photo, it's not strong enough to cover all the area with one shot. Even if you're talking about architecture, but this is some bars. It's still belongs to me in the same field. Um, it looks for me very natural that th they're standing here. In the real world, they have been quite like many, many meters away from the table. So like uh, very often, like if you arrange something on, on the location, it looks like weird, but the perspective from the camera is just so different than your eyes. Also like very often, the last chairs, they are behind the table, but on the image, it looks like they're just in the right position. So this is sometimes very, very difficult to, to arrange it in, 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 in the right way. They have been, unfortunately, I don't have a photo how far they have been away from the table, but it, look, it looks natural. Just a very normal uh, shot from outside, from a terrace, where it's Beautiful property. Well, sometimes for exterior, it's nice to get some elements within the picture, which is like this this, this bridge which belongs to this to this property. And I said before, I think exteriors are quite sometimes tricky because you, if you don't have a built opposite to go, you, or you need maybe a crane, or you need maybe a drone, but then you have to see, okay, if I'm traveling somewhere with a drone, how is the regulation with customs permissions, especially here in Dubai or UAE? Don't do anything with drone without permission. It's the fines are too high, and it's not simple, but it's possible to get the permission. So and you have to have a registered drone as well. But drones is a very, very helpful thing. But um, yes, some countries I can't travel with a drone because you have no chance to bring it in. Sometimes it's very interesting to play with the, with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the architecture of the building. It has this curve, there's a slightly curve here. You see the city, you're just about to find the right height that this glass is not exactly on here. It's like this is playing around to find. So you have to try and again, waiting for the right time. So this is not a full blue hour, this is more sunset. Like this is an image, it looks 
simple, but these images are sometimes very, very tricky because if there's so many different colors already there, it's first like um, I got a question from one already before the, uh, from you. He said he showed me one of his piece code. He said, "Why is the qua always looking then blue on my screen? It's not the real color. The cameras or even on the laptop, it's not displaying it in the right way. So just keep it in mind. How is it in reality? And fix it then afterwards. And so it's Photoshop because." It's not displayed right, so you can't do anything about it. And it's just like here, like playing additional with, 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 with light. Or sometimes, like this restaurant was, it's a very, it's in Germany, it's um, always among the 50 best restaurants in the world. Amazingly high and fine dining, but on the inside the restaurant, it's nothing, nothing really beautiful. It's very too simple. I like simple, but this is too simple. So I said, okay. Why not trying something different? So like shooting it from the outside, because here we have to play with the elements and you get this feeling, you look into it. So it turned out quite interesting and the, 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 the client liked it a lot. Because from the inside, you see the walls, it's quite empty, quite plain. It, it was not attracting me. So very often if I see, see someone, they say, oh, you can photograph this and I don't like it. Then you just have to try to to approach it from a different angle, go, like I told you, like go to other corners and think sometimes out of the box. And I said, okay, try it, fine. Let me not try this one. And in the end, it, it turned out very nicely then. At least I like it in the client. Um, this was the other same hotel, like um, again, this one was in real world, so far away, but on the photo, it looks like ah, it's a similar distance than, than this one. And what is the beautiful is on the, on the blue hour and the long exposures, like the sea is getting them lighter. Um, again, this is something where you have to play with, with the, this was a different exposure because like with the blue hour, with the long exposure of uh, two or three seconds, you hardly can see the water of the long exposure. So there you need then to change the ISO that you get a faster shutter speed, that you can freeze a little bit more the water, and then you have to just to add it in. You know already my love about the blue hour. <laughs> um, for example, on this image, there was not much much to do. There was just like I added this slide up here, but everything inside was as it was. That's more about the, the blue screen view. Sometimes architecture can be a very simple. You don't have to make it complicated. Just try to keep it simple. This is again a more tricky one where it was a lot of furniture. We removed a lot of them, and you have to do a lot of highlights. People are waiting around the corner to come in, so it's like um, sometimes it's always like a little bit of pressure because like they say, oh, we can't close it. Yeah, you don't have the photo. You don't want to have the photo. If you want to have the photo, you have to make it make it happen. For example, like this day, they said, okay, we want to have this evening shot of this dining in the desert. Um, I can't highlight with my light the, the dunes on the back because they're too far away. And if I wait until the full blue hour, the dunes are getting black. And then you, you s it looks like mountains. You, you lose all this beautiful structure inside. So I try to make it on the early, early blue hour, just like, let's say more it's like a late sunset. This element of the sofa was maybe from a little bit later than this shot. So to get a little bit this feeling of the highlight. Here I was playing with my, with my tungsten light even if it looks like, oh, this is from the, do from the torches, the, 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 the light. The more difficult part is here to, to that people have to come in from the setup on the back so that they're not getting too many trucks that you can keep the, the, the sand. And initially, uh, normally, this they set up this in the hotel for the people. It's in the other way around because on this side is the hotel. So the people look out there. But um, you don't want to make photos and the hotel is in the background. You want to have, you're in the middle of the desert. So sometimes you can shoot earlier than the blue hour. Um, just a uh, restaurant. Again, this playing with the light. Now we're coming more like slowly to this artful details. Like this was the same restaurant as before. You need this overview, but this image tells much more emotion. So the earlier image, you need this image to show the restaurant. But this one is the much more 
beautiful image, the emotion, and uh, they, they use this much more for advertising than, than the overall one, because it has this, this privacy. It's, it's a very simple shot, but as I said before, it don't always have to be complicated. Then we're coming now this more to this artful details. Um, if the clients have the, the time and the budget to do artful details, I'm very happy. Because like this is a very beautiful design piece they have, and it's like um, the colors with, with the blue, simple, but it's very interesting to use. Like if you've seen before, this is a restaurant where I told you about the symmetry with the red furniture. It was the same restaurant. This is just like a highlight about this nice little texture in the light, and it's it's a very interesting filler for the advertising, the brochures. It sells the emotion. Well, like this was one of these hotels, uh, you've seen room shots before already, where it was very wide, and there they wanted, okay, we have to show the city view. Okay, if you just photograph out by the window, um, people looking at it in booking.com or wherever, they would say, okay, yeah, it is really my view, but if you combine it a little bit with some elements from the room, everyone knows exactly, ah, oh yeah, this is really the view I have from the room. It's not showing the room, it's just showing the view connected to the room. So this is sometimes like quite elegant. Or like um, I usually, clients ask me, make photo of the, of the corridors because they're beautiful. Um, it's normally not really needed. This is an exception because it has quite nice, interesting design elements in the corridor. And like here, here I kept the color, but here I removed the color from all the reflections to keep it more or like uh, this was uh, one of the bowl rooms. It's just like an artful detail. Like um, it, it, it I think it says the name of the ballroom, and it's Arabic. Or like this sofa is also like in a suite, just in between. The room itself would not have been worth to make a photo, but like in this way, where you see this open door going into the bedroom, where we had a different image of it, and the light coming down here, it looks quite mystic, interesting, inviting. It's a nice piece of furniture, which is not, which is uh, tells a story from the whole suite. Or like this, an artful detail where you only see in the second, uh, it's a chandelier, because the graphic, the design. And if you want to do artful details, you have so many different options. You can, you can play around. And then you need, I need also very often a, a different lens, the the, the macro lens. Um, some people was asking before about shots with people in the shot. What my approach is, I take always, I, I know before where I want to have the people, but I always take before the shot without any people, because I want to have a beautiful, clear architecture shot. Now I keep my ISO down by 100, the aperture is on, I keep on 14, so I have an empty shot with the lower ISO, which is really clean, perfectly nice, then I ask the people to go in because like for getting this kind of movement, the shutter speed is like 1 over 15 or something around this. But um, I have to keep the aperture on 14, otherwise it would be like a mini zoom on the picture and it would not perfect m perfectly match if I lay it. So what I have to do, I have to ra raise then the ISO. So most probably this was ISO 1600 that I could create this shutter speed over like 1 over in the walk, so this gentleman was just standing still and I told him like just go forward, backward with the upper body, so like um, there is some blurness there, but still he is steady, so it's just like keep moving, keep moving, and I take my photos, if I find that the, the blurness is too much, I go with the ISO higher, or I just tell him you keep the same base, because if I tell him fast is lower, he'll get confused, just like easier. You keep your same base, I adjust with the ISO, the, 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 the shutter speed is faster or slower to, to, to get exactly what I want. And the same one with this, you just have to look through to be get him exactly in here. Same thing with, with like open kitchens. Like you want to have something moving in the picture. Something can be can be more sharp, it's and it's the same thing, I take one image without the people so that I have the base image. And then I'm only adding the person's, this this part in Photoshop. Actually in this image, the chef was standing here doing the walk. He, he was not able 
to make a proper fire. So the head chef is also this one. He made it himself. So actually it's the same person, but nobody's really realizing. Um, sometimes I'm using people only to get a little bit more uh, a note or, or a sense of the space because this little shop is quite beautiful with all these glasses, but adding here the human element on the very edge, it's giving a little bit more about the, the dimensions on the size. So here it's like um, here it's, it's an architecture shot with the human element. The other one was like more the human more in the foreground. Here it's just like to give some life to this interesting little shop. Like um, th this is more like the modu lifestyle, but um, it still is for hotel photography. Sometimes they ask you, oh, can we add somebody? So if I have to do lifestyle shots for hotels with people, I, w I have to insist that it's professional models because like with stuff, if they're like chef, yes, otherwise, even if somebody's beautiful, doesn't mean they're looking good on an image. Like if somebody's looking on an image not to relax, it can ruin your best image. So it's like um, you have to be very careful using non-professional models. And like this is shot, of course, with a different lens. This is with my 7200 because I love this lens because of all the background is getting compressed nicely in this natural, natural blurriness. Like um, this was a classical way for architecture with people. This is like um, was for in Abu Dhabi for the Yacht Mall. And what the difficulty was there, with big projects like this, there are creative agencies involved. And agencies very often have crazy ideas. They always say, like for this project, they said, oh, let's do everything wide angle that we show the, 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 the space and people inside. And it's like, it's in my head, it's like, oh my God. Because wide angle and people is something it's not matching. I either do a wide angle or I do people. But have wide angle and people is very difficult because if you do much on the side, it's distorted. If they're, they're quickly getting very, very small, so it's it's not an ideal combination. But um, yeah, we had to work with it. We tried our best and it, it came out quite okay-ish. So like, of course, also these people back there, they are arranged from our side. It's not random people in the mall. So these are from the, from the shoot models. Also the same up there. This is all from us same from us, because you can't have random people in a shot if it's going for advertising. So you need to have, if even if it's a friend doing the model, let him sign a, a paper model release form to, to save headaches. This is the same the same client. So there you see we had quite some people, like uh, this is my photography partner, so he was like kind of uh, producing, but we had to use everyone to be in the, in the shot somehow. And again, it was the same difficulty with this wide angle and with, with people inside. Here, it's a little bit easier because it's not that much of a wide angle. It's more like of a, a natural lens to use. It's more about like, okay, okay, they want to have it in the sunset. It's more about the light because with this, with this lighting, the people can't stand that quiet. So it's like that, then that you're not getting the blurriness of people inside because like with your shutter speed, if it's slower than 1 over 60, it could be dangerous if you zoom in, or oh, it's slightly blurred. Sorry? Me? Ah, this was, um, oh, I don't, I can't remember. I don't know when it was, it's in Aqaba. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, this is a little deep as you know. I thought you I thought you think about because of the sky, okay, because of the date. Ah, yeah. Okay, I will remember that one. Good catch. Well, like this is an exception where we are using stuff, like because um, for things like this, it's fine if you use stuff, even if it, it, it takes you a few times, a few captures more to get the right images. Or oh, this is also just used with stuff trade where you we just try to keep avoid too much branding because like you don't want to advertise for somebody else. But it's for me sometimes nice just to get this little bit of movement inside. So this is your again it's your fine line. You have to play with with the right shutter speed to get just this movement without getting him too blurry. Here it's always dangerous reflection. Because you d you don't want to have 
too much of the face of the gentleman in the picture. But this guy. Um, yeah, you, I, this spot I don't like because it's <laughs> too much. Like, on, on this image is, is a different because again uh, we, we showed up in this hotel and they said a romantic dinner on the beach but the setup was not nice, no nice table, no nice chairs, no nice nothing. Um, so on the evening in the blue hour it turned out a little bit nicer and here on purpose the people should be not the main focus so I kept them quiet on the picture frame and purposely slightly blurry. So it's a slightly blurry, the focus still remains on, on this one. Okay, yeah. So, this is my travel basic kit if I travel abroad. This is the minimum I take with me. It depends if there's lifestyle photos with models involved, I need more strobes. If there is food photography, there can be much more stuff. Let me just check the time. Okay. Yeah, I have to go a little bit faster now. Okay, this is my, the two bodies, always a backup body, the battery pack. This is the minimum lenses I take with me. This is the 2470, the, the 1124, the 100 millimeter macro, if I want to do some close up to artful details, 7200, it's always a must. The 24 millimeter, this can take, I always have with me, it's like a, doesn't take space, it's not heavy. And if you have to go somewhere to take a photo in a way, it's difficult to get in these cameras, like on destinations. This one is very small. A lot of batteries. Um, the light, the, the, the pro photo, the B1 for the main, for the room to use the strobe. This is the A1. This is the pro photo, it's quite a newish one. This is my backup kind of for this one. This is just a zoom reflector to put on this because without zoom reflector, the strobe would be too less strong for a room to capture, to brighten up the window frames, the trigger. I have this as a backup always about with me if you're somewhere like uh, having a blue hour shot or something and um, you can't bring the laptop with you, you don't want to press on the camera because it always moves. Even if there's a, It's much better having this one, it's connected, you press and the camera stays steady. This one is a very interesting thing, it's called the lens skirt. I, maybe you have realized that one of the earlier slides where it showed me in different variation of taking photos, there was one photo. I was taking a photo through the window from the outside. And it could be happen during day or in the evening that you can't switch off all the light. Then you would have reflections in the window and you can't shot through the windows. And there are many places you can't open the window. You don't have an access. So the lens goes in here. This one, you just stick it on the window and it's beautiful. So you don't get any reflections on the window. Sometimes in this region, the windows are always dirty and it's difficult to let them clean because they, we went to Beirut for shooting and said, oh, cleaning the window for the hotel costs them $8,000 or more. And if, if you have to th shoot through the window, it's always good if you keep quite an open aperture, like eight or something, and you focus on the infinity because then all the dirt on the window is, is blurry, it's not sharp, so it's less visible. So this comes in very, very handy. These are my two lights for the tungsten. I have also the barn doors, I'm not in the picture there. So again, you see there on this, on this, these two batteries working with these two lights. So sometimes I can use two and then when one breaks, I still have one and I can manage. So I always try to have backup. Um, a light stand, an umbrella, like this is the geared head from Manfrotto, which is beautiful because it's like, it's a normal ball head. If you close it, the camera moves slightly. And I'm losing a little bit of the, of the balance. With this kind of geared head, I can adjust it very, very gently so that the camera is really perfectly leveled. My the carbon uh, tripod with the four segments, so it's smaller to back. This tripod is at first a, a backup, and secondly, for, for my platform where I can put my computer on it. So it's very handy for somewhere. My computer is in my height and not somewhere. It's my, my laptop is on this stand. The, the wire to connect the long one, and again, always a backup wire. I just had it last week in Cairo on my shoot. 
the, the front part of my wire, somehow somebody was putting it somewhere and it got like, like a little bit off. So I couldn't put it back in the camera. Luckily, the camera plug-in is much stronger than this one. So the wire gets the defect. So I had my backup wire with me. So this is always good backup. This is <laughs> one of the most important, the duct tape. I never go on a shoot without a duct tape because there's always somewhere something I have to fix. If it's a wire or something falls down, with a duct tape, it's my best friend. It really sticks. Um, this black fabric, it's always with me. I'll show you in a little while why. Because when you have somewhere glass or something, there's often reflection and you can't avoid the reflection where polarization filter is not helping. With this black fabric, I can avoid a lot of reflections and this saves a lot of time in the post-production. So I did too much Photoshop and I know how much work it can be. And it's just the saving time. A reflector is always there as well. And one bag which is like filled with um, screwdriver, electrical candles, because sometimes you have to shoot outside, there's a little bit wind, normal candles will not work. I have electrical candles, I have Spanex. So like little things or like spare bulbs for this light, all the little things which can be useful if you're somewhere on location or spare batteries. And I have a second head with me because sometimes it can happen in exceptions that I'm five days, five days somewhere, but I need six blue hour shots. And w if one blue hour shot has to be here and the second one has to be here, I can do two. Either I'm doing it with one camera or I put one camera in here and the other camera is here. already set up so I can swap quickly. And also if something is breaking, I have a second one. This, this one? I'm using it not often. It's more like I said, if you're somewhere destination shots and you're not allowed to bring in a camera because you need permission, uh, I can play tourist. I have this camera, this little lens, and it's not that obviously like big lens. But it's 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 a good quality. It's very cheap. Doesn't need place. Sometimes it's nice, but I'm using it not often. So normally I'm using this big box, which is inside. Most probably you know, it's inside this foam where you can. Uh, customized that your lens fits in, your lights fit in perfectly. I love it. But the problem is all the customers from all over, they love it as well. As soon as you come with a box like this to the airport, what is it? So it's like a, it's a lot of headache. I have always invitation letters from my clients. I'm the approved uh, or the official photographer coming in and blah, blah, blah. But still sometimes customs, because it looks big, they make trouble. So I always I take photos, I always have to say, okay, it's still photos, not video, because video, they're even more sensitive. And this box attracts a lot of attention. And additionally, it's empty already quite heavy with almost 10 kilos. So out of my frustration on customs, I got now one of these trolleys, which is like this front loader, which opens on the front. I put, <coughs> I put the same foam as it inside there, because you can buy the foam on itself. I put the same foam inside here with the same compartments for my lens, for my lights, for my everything. It <coughs> and traveling with this one, customs ask me only a few times what it is if you scan it. Most of the time you can just walk through. So it's just like, yeah, this is for traveling. No, 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 no this is check-in. This is check-in. Yes, yes, yes. This is foam inside. It's perfect. It's covered. I, I was traveling with it. 50 times because the check-in is my camera bag with the camera and the main in this. I, I have normally the, the backup body inside there, this lens, the 100 millimeter macro lens, this light, this all these tripods and this light. So in my cabin bag is only the laptop, these two lenses and one body because of weight. The backup camera is in the check-in. But it's very well protected with this foam. So it's like, that's very good. So I have to go a little bit through because we, from the time wise. So these are some samples now about retouching. So this is a final image. And I show you like, this is now the image where you see my assistant was holding the strobe for there. I don't care about this reflection here, but I need the light here. So I have to take it always from, from two different angles. So 
even, no, and you will not see it in this one, with this strobe, even if you have a wooden floor, it removes the daylight reflections. If there's an artwork, the artwork is nice. So for me, it was just this, this spark. Because with the, with the normal exposure, this is very black. And if I add this one with the outside view, it's very, very detailed for the retouching. If I have this one with the, with the strobe, okay, it's just like this, I don't like, because this room was like not the one room which had the right view, so here we had to change the view, but it's easier to retouch it from here than, than out from this one, the view. And then from here, I start take more exposures to get slightly inwards, even more slightly inwards, and normally there's even one more image. Yeah, uh, this is uh, back to the, to the final one. Um, I have coming another sample with this one. This is one sample now for the evening shot. So there's this, this is again in Kazakhstan, there's a beautiful mountain range outside, and if you see here, I kept purposely some reflections. Because if the lights are off, because here it was, the hotel was not open, they couldn't switch off all the lights. So I had from this big one, I kept a little bit here, there was a lot of reflections here in the light, so it was not, not nice, because they couldn't switch off all the lights. So we had to do then, like if, if you see here, this you see the amount of reflections, they couldn't switch this one off. So I, I took different exposures for the, even with this light off, there was still too much up there. So I had to go to the window to take one shot just of the mountain range and to put it in where it really is and just keep some reflection. Because if there is no reflection, it looks artificial. Like um, uh, this is a, <coughs> a spy image. You then now, now you can tell already. Okay, I was giving a highlight here. Where am I, where is there? there was a highlight down there. There was I was standing there giving a highlight there. I have a remote control on my mobile phone application to press to make an exposure when if I'm away. But here was my assistant pressing, and I was running around giving the highlight. Like also on this image with this evening is the same thing. Why I was this blue hours, I start taking image early enough because suddenly it goes so quickly. And even if this is far too bright, this will already get in dark. And I still have some details here to get in. So I was making some light here. You can see me here, like taking some light over here. This was, uh, you see how, how dark it already is. There was light here, there was light there. There was light more in the desert. So that you, on the end, you combine, even if you sometimes have more light taken, it's easier to have a few images more, and then you combine it to the one. Like this is one of the f last few samples. Like again, you see this, this lights on this one here, the light here. Here you can tell the long exposure because it was windy, but I don't care. So it's starting early, a system is going around, and on the end you combine the other things. With the bus, this is obviously kept a little bit, some reflections you need that look real. But if you take the photo, this one is hard looking. You see the amount of reflections you have everywhere? Because this slide and this spot is everything on one switch. You couldn't switch off. And the easiest way to do avoid it is my beloved black fabric. Like you see the my, my duct tape, putting it a dowel over there, sticking this, and you have almost no reflection. I had to remove just the shadow, but there's a reflection gone. And then on the final image, it looks much nicer. So the black fabric, I love it. This is on, uh, just one sample, like it's a, it's a villa. This is like one shot, you show everything, then you can go a little bit closer where you show like this beautiful details and all these things. And if you want, you can go even much closer to show the details and all this one. And this is something for me, um, what is also very important for you to give an away, sometimes you have to say also no, because customers or clients out there, they say, I, I told you I make like seven to 10 images a day. There was customers who asked me, oh, can you make 30 images a day? <laughs> I said, if I take 30 images, it's a snapshot. Uh, I 
you don't do it because my name is anonymous. So sometimes we're in the studio, say, oh, can I make a quick one snapshot from this room, which is not prepared? I said, no, I can't. Because if I take, it goes then to brand, brand looks at it, the brand doesn't know the circumstances why you took this photo. Look at this, oh, Gary made nice image previously. This is not so nice anymore because they don't know how it happened. So then it reflects back bad to you. So you have to, to be aware and also be able to say, no to a client. So this is it's a process. Like I went through, through many things where like after the I said no. So it's like it's, it's a learning process. So um, yeah, this was more or less my my workshop. I think all is already waiting. I think we still would have time for a few minutes for questions and answers before there's one more element coming from Heber about an event for them. Any questions? Don't be shy. Nobody questions? Yes, please. Polarized filter is working ideally in elements where the light can enter, enter fully, like water. There it's beautiful. On, the, on things like metal or lac or glass, it is more limited. It removes some reflections, but not as much as good as with the, with the fabric. Anyone else? Any questions? Best market? Ah, marketing. Oh. Uh, at the beginning, when I moved to Dubai, like um, I tried to visit all the agencies, uh, and all the decision makers in the hotel brands. You show them the portfolio. They say, mm, "Yeah, looks good. If it's good enough, they let you try to shoot on one of their hotels. And if it's good enough there, or like for example, in Ritz Khan, like it, you have to shoot on two properties." And then the, the, the decision comes then from Washington, you're approved or not. But at the beginning, it's like agencies, because the agencies have contacts. So if you're listed with an agency, they're doing for you getting jobs. Even they try to give it to different photographers, but this is the way. You have to go to agencies, and if you select your way of architecture, then you have to start going like to hotels or like to real estate or whoever is in need or, or developer for, for buildings. You have to build up your portfolio. The more portfolio you have, the higher your, your clientele will get. It's 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 it would work, but I'm never using it in this way because like no, I find I find it in this way. There there's always like in there's always more than one solution. It's like the one you feel comfortable and is working for you. I think you got a nice question. Um, because the inside is the inside is somehow more tricky because of you need more layering the inside to your outer piece and the outside is more about a to get the right point from there to photograph it and it's that you keep the verticals so that this chip as I said is better for the outside to give than for the inside and outside um, it's more difficult to explain in, in a workshop or, the, or that it's, it's, it's less to, to talk about than the whole combination of things are but it's a bit there you should think about your chip for the outside. Yeah. Um, whatever.
whatever your budget, budget can afford, but like nowadays the entry level cameras, they have already very good quality. So take an entry level body, save a little bit of money, make some events or some small jobs, and with the first money, put it in, into lenses. Because the lenses is something, you can have the same lens for 10 years. The body in 10 years is old generation, so like, yeah, somehow. In, 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 I generally like uh, the rules of thumb, zoom in as far you can. Use as less wide angle as possible. If the space is small, you end up using extremely wide angle, which is not ideal, but still the best you can do. So then you have to be very careful that the camera is really balanced, because the slightest of balance in the camera, your verticals and lines getting getting greasy. So you have to have the widest lens always with you. Any more questions? Yes, please. Um, nowadays, I'm not using it here because it's um, with a digital back, it would be for my hotel clients too much of data, too big of data. Um, in the old days, we did interior photography with Tina, but then it was like a film, and you have the Polaroid first because this was a difficult part in the old days. A hotel room, you have to capture in one shot, outside and inside. So you needed more strobes, the right exposure and the Polaroid you could check, how how big the strobes, and then you have make it on film. And this was difficult, but Tina is used today from photographers for landscape because the, the resolution is amazing, and the quality, or for, for exteriors, for outside of building, it's also beautiful. I, I love the large format because there are possibilities, but for hotel photography, it would be not practical for me. you have to have it in your hand package. Because A aviation rules. Okay, okay everyone, Ready? thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary, it was very interesting. Uh, people, we need five minutes from your t time. You agree? Okay, cool. We have our Instagram uh, competition, and we will, uh, you will have the privilege today to choose the best winner. Cool, yeah? But the best winner will not be from this uh, <laughs> room. <laughs> then you can call him and ask him to make the prize 50-50. Huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> 